Y'all, we just heard one of the greatest sermons ever preached. I don't know if y'all caught that or not. That's one of the greatest messages I've ever heard put in, in that video. And thank you, Brother Mike. Thank you, choir. We take you for granted um, too often. We bless the Lord for you. <laughs> well, I have uh, uh, the undesirable duty to follow that. So let's take the Word of God and let's put some practical application onto what we've seen thus far. And I want you to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. We are uh, dealing with a series um, this month dealing with faith. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm, my heart this morning, I've got a twofold bur burden. I, I, I do obviously have a, a deep burden for our nation. Uh, we unapologetically as Christian believers, as Christian members of this nation, uh, want to be salt and light to the community. I, I, while you're finding uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, let me just preface my preaching by saying, simply saying this, you do not be deceived in being removed from the conversation in our culture. You don't have to acquiesce to the felonious idea that somehow or another because you're a believer that you have to keep your Christianity and the conversation of faith behind stained glass and beneath a steeple in a, in a quiet place called a church. The, the, the gospel was not about primarily gathering. It was, it's primarily about going. It's about following. And that, that's part of the burden of what we're going to look at this morning. So as believers, I, I, I want to say this to us as members of, as citizens in this paradox that we live in. We are not citizens of this world, yet we're, we're blessed to be citizens of a nation that is in a moral free fall. That's not a partisan statement. I, um, I, I'm, I'm not in any way disrespecting the helm by becoming partisan, but this idea that the church, that the helm, that pastors don't have a voice in the community is, is a demonic idea. And let me explain to you why they don't want us in the classrooms with your children. They don't want us in the universities with, with our young people, our, our adults. And they want us to sequester what we have to say to the privacy of our own collective meetings. This is why. If you will notice, that they're, they're, not, they're not worried. They don't ban the name of Muhammad. They, they don't ban the name of Buddha. You, you can pray in the name of God in general in, in, in our nation without it being an immediate offense or uncomfortableness in the room. Why is it that when we pray specifically in the matchless mighty name of Jesus, I'm going to tell you why, because at his name, demons get uncomfortable. At his name, mountains have to move. Deception has to flee. They are fine with us generically, ge you know, just generally talking about who we are as believers. But when you get specific and who we are affects where we live, that's when they get uncomfortable. So what you have going on right now is, is not only the dismantling of a nation, but it's a demonic attempt to steal the influence because if America could fall, if they could shut the churches down, if they could stop by some ridiculous plan the gospel, which I, I want you to hear me, listen to me, as bad as it is, as, as we look at the intentional destruction economically to move us to a digital currency, why? What's, what's the plot? What's the plan? In order to produce a platform so that one man can rise to the, to, to the global platform to say, I'm going to control what you spend, what you buy, what you eat, where you go, what you do. I'm going to, if I could borrow their, their terminology, you will own nothing and be happy. I mowed my grass yesterday. I'd be glad for them to come do it. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not political. It's, it's spiritual. What they're trying to convince us is that somehow or another, the world is in the shape it's in because the gospel is not effective. I'm submitting to you today that as, as one man said when he was asked why he didn't, be, you know, his thought on Christianity, he simply said it this way. He said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's just not been tried. Okay, y'all go on and think about that a minute. Let me say that again. It's not that Christianity has been found and wanting. It's that it's never been tried. 
We, what, what, what does it look like for a church to rise up and to live in faith that is, that is not just, it's not offensive, but it's aggressive in the sense that we understand that we're not criticizing people who don't understand their sexuality. We are burdened because they're demonically deceived that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die on a cruel cross so that we wouldn't have to live in sexual dysphoria. We could, we could live in the glorious plan that our father has for us for it's a beautiful thing when a man finds a woman and a woman finds a man and they become husband and wife and they have children. That's a beautiful thing. And before you start altering who they are in elementary school, you understand what I'm saying to you? I know this is, uh, I know this is uncomfortable. I know that I can feel the letters and the emails coming at the moment. But that's okay. You need to know who we are because we're not for everybody. You know, so we love everybody, but there's a line of truth that has to be stood on. Do you understand that? So, I mean, one, one, this is not original, but it, it's, it's definitely il illustrative of what all of us have gone through. And you have to understand as believers, it's not that we're offensive to the culture. It's that we're salt that, that brings a little bit of a sting, but it purifies the culture. It brings a purity, not because of who we are, but because of the gospel that we hold to. I'm, I'm thankful. Thank God. I, 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 it's been a little bit of an emotional couple of days. Christy and I have been talking about just that we grew up really in part of the you know, part of the greatest part of this nation. We grew up in a day when, when you know, I'm not romancing it, but, you know, you, you could go outside and play. And, you could, in fact, we were made to go outside. I, we were made to go outside. We, when the, we got out the house, if you wanted a drink, you went to the creek. I'm not kidding. You went to the creek or you went to the garden hose. You understand what I'm saying? And the youngest had to drink from the garden hose because it was still warm. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you went to the creek, the youngest went because you want to see if the thing's floating down. They got it first. You understand what I'm saying? If you did something wrong on the other side of the neighborhood, the neighbor whooped you. Then they called your mama. Your mama whooped you. And then your mama said, you wait till your daddy get home. Are y'all with me? There was no timeout. There was knockout. Not everybody got a trophy. Everybody didn't get a trophy because everybody doesn't win. You want to win? Do the work. Put the sweat in. Get up off your blessed backside. Get out there and do what nobody else is willing to do, and you'll be a winner. If not, you know what you are? A loser. You a loser. That's what you are. Suck it up, buttercup. You a loser. You just got to suck it up. Okay, I lost. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't gripe my whole brief school experience because they didn't recruit me for basketball. Do you understand that? They never came to me and said, boy, you'd make a great center. I'm telling you, LaBorg, you just, you look like, I, there's nothing in me that's supposed to play basketball. Do you understand? I'm not much taller than the ball. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, I didn't sue the Basketball Association of the school. I didn't sue them and say, well, you know, it's, it's wrong because I, I, am, I, I, am, I am vertically challenged. And I ought to have the same rights that the sons of Nephilim. I mean, big people have. You read your Bible, you'll get that later. As believers, we have, we have not only the right, but the responsibility to say, don't give away the, the liberty we've been given in Christ. And it's not even constitutional, though it is. It, it's, it's fundamental to who we are. God made us in his image. It doesn't matter whether you live in America or you live in Africa. It doesn't matter whether you're a Ukrainian Jew or you're, you're, a, you're, you're a Palestinian. God so loved the world. And when you give this away, that's why they want us. That's why we're the last holdout. I know, I know what I'm about to say is going to get mixed reviews. That's why we have deacons. <laughs> That's why we need new ones, because I'm about to sacrifice three of them right now. <laughs> the, the, the whole debate, the whole debate about, uh, regardless of where you stand on the Second Amendment, listen to me. When, when they wrote the Second Amendment, in, 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 they were not coming home from deer hunting. Do you understand that? They'd not been in the, in, in the Appalachian Mountains hunting bear. They'd been throwing off the tyranny of a crown that wanted to tax them into oblivion over a cup of tea. Uh, they, they got in a fight over a cup of tea. They'd lose their minds they went to Walmart today. Do you understand what I'm saying? The, the, the Second Amendment isn't about the gun safety. It, 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 
The first murder in the Bible, he picked up a rock and slew his brother. You can't ban all rocks. Do you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't the rock that killed Abel. It was the hand, it was the rock in the hand of a wicked heart that killed him. Now you can debate what you want about it. You can say what you want about it, but the reason they want them from you is because the first thing they do is disarm you in order to take your liberty from you. Do you understand that? Now I know we're I know there's some folk tearing up guest cards right now. I know that, but listen to me. Don't give away what was paid for on the beaches of Normandy, on the islands of the Pacific, in the jungles of Vietnam. There's a reason you're not speaking Japanese or German or Korean today because men and women paid it all that we might all be here today. So how do you wed this to the Christianity? How do we invade this nation that is giving itself over to the seducing last day's doctrines of demons. And I'm not being romantic. I understand that we are moving to what many believe will be a traumatic crescendo this fall. And I'm not being ominous. I'm not being a spook. I'm just simply saying to you, I understand we mobilized 100,000 troops this, this week under kind of under the radar. We're, we're bumping up to 600,000. They dropped um, all requirements to join the United States Army. You, you, have, you don't even take an ASVAB right now because they are hemorrhaging so quickly. What I'm saying to you is they are marshalling, they are preparing, they're moving themselves. The stage is being set for this chaos that is, that is infecting our land. It is, it is coming to a crescendo. Now, I personally believe we're on the brink of what's called the rapture of the church. I'm not setting a date. I'm not setting a time. I'm just telling you not as a Baptist, but as a believer, not as a seminary graduate, but as a, as a preacher of the gospel. We are moving to a moment when in the twinkling of an eye, the church of the living Lord God is going to be caught up. We're going to be, we're going to meet Christ in the clouds. Those who are dead in Christ are coming first. Those of us that remain We'll drop this bag of bones. We'll be gloriously translated. We're going into a place that has been prepared for us over the last 2,000 years. And the moment, the moment that that rapture takes place, the Bible says that he that restraineth the Holy Ghost that's keeping all the evil of the world, all of those who are meeting in the World Economic Forum, uh, uh, let me borrow their language this week, the new liberal world order. Well, I'm not part of the new liberal or world order. I'm part of that flag right there. I belong to a sovereign nation called the United States of America bought by the blood of men and women who shed everything they had that we might stand in a place called the United States of America to speak what we believe to be right, holy, and true. In that moment, in that moment that we are coming in on called the rapture of the church, what, what happens before that, right before that? According to biblical prophecy, there will be a stirring in the hearts of those who are receptive, Joel chapter two. Now, how, now, now, now this gets a little this gets a little outside the, the bounds of some, but it's Bible, so I'm just going to give it to you. According to the Word of God in Joel chapter two, something will begin to happen in the hearts of both men and women, both fathers and sons. Uh, sons will begin to have visions. Now, don't get kooky, don't get goofy. Stay with me. A vision is simply the word of God sitting down in your spirit and giving you a vision of what God wants to do through you because he saved you by grace through faith. It's, it's not your great intellectual idea. It's that you spent so much time with the Father that you've been in the Word with the Father and the Spirit has so transformed you that you are now on a supernatural frequency in order to get a vision from God about why he did what he did when he saved you, sealed you, and got you ready to go to heaven. Do, are, you, are you tracking with me? Now, in order to embrace that vision, I've got to have faith. I've got to have faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God. I know from Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that the righteous live from faith to faith. What, what in the world does that mean? That means in that, in that moment of childlike faith, when I came to the realization that I'm a sinner that deserves to go to hell in that moment when the Holy Spirit opened my eyes. Perhaps it'll happen in this room today, maybe through the lens of that camera. The Holy Ghost of God sat down, peeled my eyes back because my natural wicked mind could not receive the things of God. Faith stepped into my heart and said, come here, come here. You can't buy it. You can't barter it. You can't earn it. You can't come get it. But I'm telling you on the cross of Calvary by grace, God gave you what you didn't deserve so that by mercy, he would hold back what you did deserve. He stripped his son 
sun naked, laid him between heaven and earth. The sun refused to shine. Angels wept. The father turned away. He struck him because he became what you are. And in that moment, the grace that saved you is now the faith that's wooing you to the cross. And if you'll yield yourself, if you will yield yourself in your sin, if you'll exchange your wickedness for his righteousness, if you'll exchange your home for hell, for a home called in heaven, I'm telling you, in that moment when faith came in, if you responded, you're saved. Now, you're not just saved in order to get out of hell. That faith, that from faith, that embryonic, that, 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 that early infancy of that moment, I, I, you know, we didn't understand the virgin birth. We didn't fully comprehend the inerrancy of the word of God. We knew none of the theological semantics that we know as mature believers, but something gripped our heart in that moment. And in that moment when we came to the awareness that we were on our way to hell and the grace of God stepped in to save us, and by faith, it wasn't even my faith. He gave me the faith to believe. I, I didn't even have the belief to believe. He gave me the belief to believe, and all I had to do was believe to believe. Right? So if that early faith, if that early faith, now this is the second part of my burden this morning, not just as a people in America, as citizens, Christians, but my burden is also for our students. They're getting ready to step off into camp. It's a, it's a sequestered week when they're going to go away, and very intentionally under the direction of our, of our student pastor, they're going to look at what I call in my private praise and prayer time, I call it the wardrobe of the warrior, Ephesians chapter 6. You put those pieces on, there is one piece called the shield of faith. It has the capacity to extinguish, to put out the fiery darts of hell. So under that thought, for just a few minutes, I, I, I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the definition of faith, because without faith... It's impossible to please God. We grow from faith to faith. And then the scripture says, faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. So, so look, if you would, at Hebrews 11 very quickly. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that word substance, is, it's a compound word. And I'm not going to bore you with this, but I want the students to get a hold of this. It's, it, it's, it's a compound word that means to... to lay a concrete foundation. It means to come under and to buttress up, to build a firm foundation. So faith is the substance of things not seen. That doesn't even make sense, does it? Wait, now wait a minute. If it's, if it's substance, substance you can see. When I leave here, if I go get a substance of Oreo cookies, I want to see them. Can I get a witness in the house? I do, don't bring me a gift uh, of hypothetical Oreos. Preacher, I'm giving you a gift of Oreos in the spirit. I don't want them in the spirit. I want them in the blue bag that rips off the top so that you can eat them in Gatling gun fashion. Do you understand what I'm saying? But that the Bible says that faith is the substance of things not seen. What in the world? Well, the, the word, quite literally, it, it, it means foundational or concrete. It means that you can hold it in your hand. Now, I, I'm going to see if I can illustrate this very quickly. I'm going to just walk through this. It's the substance of things not seen. This word is most frequently used uh, for title deed to property. So here's what happens. Faith is a substance of things not seen. The moment you got born again, something supernaturally happened inside of you that you by faith have got to walk in in order for it to come to fruition. For example, if you believe that Christ dying on the cross and coming out of the tomb on the third day not only atoned for your sins at Calvary but empowered you in the empty tomb because the same spirit that brought him out of the tomb is the same spirit that both wooed you and empowered you to live for him. Say amen. Okay, so if faith is the, is the substance of things not seen, it's the title deed. Okay, how does that work out? Well, if you go today and you purchase a piece of property that's undeveloped, in essence what this is saying is this. You by faith have purchased that property. That's what Christ did. You are a new creation in Christ. You're no longer your own. You did not get redeemed to be remodeled. You died in Christ. That's why when we baptize, we, you are buried in Christ, risen in the light. You didn't get remodeled. You didn't get re, re, renewed. You got killed. God killed you. And he resurrected you so that the new you could live by faith, meaning this, 
that as I walk by faith, Lord, you said that if I confess you, in just a moment we're going to give a gospel invitation. And I'm going to tell you, people push back on this all the time. This is how simple it is. That if the Holy Spirit of God has touched your heart this morning and said, you, you are going to hell, and I sent my son to deliver you from hell, and if this morning you'll confess your sin, confess your sin, for whomever confesses, believing in his heart, confesses out of his mouth. Why? Because the, the mouth confesses what the heart believes. So the moment that I come to the awareness through the Holy Spirit of God that I'm a sinner, the moment I make that confession, I'm telling you the blood of Calvary was appropriated to my life, not for the sins I had committed to that point, but for every sin I ever committed, they're all paid. So if you ask me this morning, because the average Baptist, if you, if you ask the average Baptist this, they'll say, you say to them, hey, do you know if you, if you were to die today, where, where would you go? This is the average Baptist response. Well, I hope I'd go to heaven. Come here, goober. Come here. John said, I write these things that you might know. You might know that you have eternal life. So I, not based on my merit, not based on my preaching, not based on anything, but the fact that there was a moment when Jeff Laborg, who deserved to go to hell, was confronted by the reality of the cross, and I understood that if I would settle out of court, if I would just let my, my, my lawyer go to take my sentence, at that moment, my sin was forgiven. The same faith that saved me at that moment is now the faith in me that's developing me. You understand that? Don't get saved just by faith enough to get out of hell because the faith that came to you to save you from hell is now the faith that's working in you to get you ready to go to heaven. You, you are being developed right now by faith to apply the word of God. So that, let's circle this back around. If that's the definition of faith, now, now watch this very quickly because we're, 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 I'm preaching on standard hot dog time, so... Look, look one more time. Substance, that, that's, that's, the, that's a title deed. Evidence, that word quite literally means proof. It means evidence that something's going on. So faith is the substance of things not seen. It's the evidence. It's the evidence. And, and he says it's a witness. It's a testimony. Now, now, here's, what, here's what I'm trying to get to you. I'm going to say this to the students and for those of you who are going to be praying over them. This week, when, when you go to camp, you're going to have to decompress. You, you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I'm not fussing. I'm just stating a fact. Our minds are so cluttered with, with the world that it's hard sometimes for the spirit to speak to us. Because we, we, you remember a couple of weeks ago I told you, on average, on average, a, a, we, we interact with our cell phones 3,500 times a day. There is now a full psychological profile in hospitals across the land because of the psychosis, depression, and psychological side effects that when they can't get to their phone, because now we're in a generation that's never not had a phone, I would like to say on behalf of those who didn't, we would not miss them. Oh, you bunch of liars. I, I missed the day when you had to call my house and that sucker was drilled to the wall. And if I was with my family, you couldn't find me. I, I'm just, y'all, come on, tell me the truth now. Now, most of y'all don't feel like that because you're always reading somebody else's mail, but that's not the point. We, we're cluttered up. We're cluttered up. So there's so much going on that sometimes when the Spirit's trying to build a foundation, we, we can't get to the evidence. We can't get to the proof of it. You... When it comes to faith exercising, you have to understand that God's not a drive through he's, he's not McDonald's. You can't go to camp this week. You can't go away to a conference and order it in a sack and pick it up at the second window. There's times when he's got he's to beat the you out of you in order to get the him in you. You understand that? And so what happens is when faith comes in to remove the stuff that's keeping us from being who he created us to be, we get, we get resistant because there's, we have this idea that God's just going to you know, wave a, a magic wand and boom, turn us into what he wants us. No, he has to take the us out of us in order for him to get the him in us so that we got more him than us. You understand that? So he says, here's the foundational work and here's the proof. And then he says, it's a testimony. It's a witness. 
I, I want you to imagine something for just a moment. I want you to imagine those who for the last 50 years have begged God for the reversal of Roe versus Wade. Now, regardless of how you feel about this, I want you to understand something. Every child, every child, regardless of whether they were planned or not, is a miracle from God. There's not one illegitimate child ever been born. There's not one accident in the economy of God's great heaven. There's never been a kid that was going to be more of an inconvenience than a divine gift from God. I don't care who they are or where they were born. They were never meant to be terminated in the womb. They were never meant to be harvested and sold for parts like we're doing in this land and so for 50 years can you imagine people interceding standing on street corners believing God the church lampooned them made fun of them mocked them said it would never happen and I'm telling you to the unbelievable absolute miracle of God do you know that not only did God reverse it but God is now in this past week do you know how many children that would not have lived were born and in that in that in that number could be Billy Graham of this generation could be the birth of Smith could be the mission it could be the preacher, the teacher. I'm telling you, who knows what God's up to? So the foundation is this. God, even when I can't see it, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to stand flat-footed, and I'm going to honor your word so that here's the definition of faith. It is working out in me even when I can't see it. Now, now, how does that practically lay out? Now, I'm glad you asked that. Here's my last point. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. I want you to go over to... Uh, the gospel according to Mark, and I want you to hold your place, and I'm going to end right here with a biblical illustration of the components of faith. What, 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 does, what does faith, if it's, if it's the foundation and the evidence, and it's the outworking, the testimony, literally that word is martyr, in that when God starts doing a work, young men will, will, will um, have visions, old men will dream dreams. I just won't go on the record, I'm still having visions. In case any of you Weisenheimers around here, I'm still having visions. What is the point of that last day's prophecy? Those who are willing to not let the climate or the politics of the moment interfere with the speaking of the word of God and the work of the spirit will not see the desolation of the land. They will see the opportunity to take the gospel into the land. What good does complaining do? What, what good does it do to curse the darkness? I'm simply submitting to you that, that we have a leadership problem in this nation. Now, how you feel about that is up to you. I, this happens to be my sermon, so I'm going to say it this way. We have a leadership problem in this nation. We have people that don't know up from down, right from wrong, in from out. In fact, we got a couple don't know whether they're in or out. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have a serious leadership problem in this nation. We are quickly becoming divided along racial and political lines. Why is that? Because we need a leader. We need somebody anointed of God. Now, I would like to submit to you that perhaps, now you're going to think that I've lost my ever-loving mind for the manyth time you think I've lost my ever-loving mind. But can you imagine that by faith, from faith to faith, could it be that in this obscure place called Fairview Knox Church on the other side of Knoxville, Tennessee, could it be that God might have in this very, in this very faith family a young man or a young woman that's being stirred up in their faith and God's doing something. No, it's not primarily athletics. It's, it's a fresh anointing. It's not business. It's more Bible. It's not CEO. It's more servant. And in this fellowship is a man or a woman or men and women young that are about to rise up with an, a unique anointing on their life. And from this very fellowship will stand up in the midst of a culture that wants to slaughter children and confuse us sexually. And with the grace of God, stand and proclaim the word of God and out of this fellowship be the very instrument that God uses to bring a great revival. Now, see, if you can't believe that, you've missed faith. Because if we can't believe God for that in this fellowship, then why are we here? Why are we spending the money to send these kids to camp? Why, why, why teach them precept upon precept, line upon line? I mean, if all we're going to do is stick a wiener on a stick and sing kumbaya and, and huddle around a campfire and have a good time, then let's go to the house and save some money. But if by the sweet name of Jesus, a dad sitting down with his kid and saying, listen, I'm going to tell you something. This isn't just about the White House. This is about, this is about the fact that we've got the right in this nation to stand on every corner in this, in this nation and hold up the word of God and preach the unfallible word of God. You've got the right to walk in a high school 
by the way, by the way, by the way, they told that coach he has the right to pray in a ball field anytime he wants to. So let me just say this. Let me just say this. If you're happy about that, I double dog dare you to start praying over our local schools. Don't complain about the, the, the school teacher. Pray for the school teacher. My God in heaven, they're trying to raise your kid and you can't even raise your kid. Do you understand what I'm saying? Woo, hallelujah. <laughs> what, what are the components? What are the components of faith? Okay, God, I'm ready to step out. I'm being stirred up. And I, 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 don't, I don't just want the liberty of the land. I don't want just the amber waves of grain. I want to just live off the fatness of your faithfulness, God. I want to leave this world with souls in my hand. I want to make a difference. Listen to me, mom and dad. I'm begging you in Jesus' name. Do not leave it up to the schools. Don't leave it up to the universities. Don't leave it up to the church. I'm, I'm begging you, turn off that television. Pull them in close and talk to them about what radically changed your life. Why is it you stayed when other men left, dad? Why is it, mom, that you operate in agreement with a house under the priesthood of your husband when other women are lampooning that? Why did you stay? Talk to them about their grandparents and great-grandparents that paid the price on D-Day and in the Pacific. Talk to them about those soldiers that were, that were re rejected and disrespected that came back from Vietnam wearing our colors and were spit on. They owe, they owe them uh, not only their gratitude, this nation owes them an apology. Talk to them. Set them down and you're rising up and, and you're going out and say to them, listen, this on her, on her worst day, this is still the greatest place to live. Why? Because fundamentally, foundationally, we are a people of faith. And the foundation of our faith has been manifested in such a way that we were given a title deed. And if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, when I hear a word from God, it is incumbent on me to apply it by faith. Listen to me, students. You're going to get confronted this week with a word. God's going to read you mail. And you're going to have to make a decision. Now, the same way that you just simply by faith said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Accept, accept me a sinner. I receive you as my Savior. I confess my sin. And in that moment, faith was sealed and you were given a title deed to heaven. That's what's going to happen this week at camp. They're going to be confronted with a word and they're going to have to make a decision. God's going to say, I, I want this. Now, listen, it may not be a sin. See, we're bad about this. We, we wait for God to show us the sin we're in. Sometimes it's not, the, it's not the sin we're in that God shows us first. Sometimes it's the weight that keeps us from running the race. I've had God say to me a couple times in my life, he wanted some things, and I said to God, well, God, that's not a sin. He said, no, Jeff, but it's an idol. And you love that thing better than you do me. And, and right now, right now, Jeff, I, I, we're not talking about the sin. We're going to get to that, son. <laughs> we're going to get to that. But before we can get to the sin, we got to get with, before your heart can get right with the sin, I got to have this thing that's a weight that's encumbering you. I'm going to get a little personal here. Y'all okay? I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. I wasn't brought up around things of faith. I, uh, I really didn't understand what it meant to even be an American. We just took all that for granted. When I got saved, I, I, didn't, I didn't have any of the vernacular. I didn't have any of the language of Christianity. I didn't know how to talk. In fact, I lost most of my vocabulary when I got saved. <laughs> oh, there's some real people in here today. <laughs> Woo! Praise the God. This is why I love y'all. I didn't know much other than I'd been saved, and then I noticed that there was a couple things that, um, because of the home I grew up in, my dad was effectively orphaned. His mother was married uh, reportedly nine times. Her name was not Elizabeth Taylor. And uh, my dad was just kind of moved around from pillar to post, from family to family, state to state. And my dad had one goal in life, and that was to not be poor. He, he, wanted, he wanted to be rich. And he achieved that to a great, unbelievable extent. So money was an important thing in my life, and it, it was something that kind of haunted me because going into the ministry, my dad was very upset with me when I told him that I was not coming into the family business. And he said to me, you'll starve to death, and you'll forget this foolishness of religion. You'll come back to me hungry. 
Well, I, I just knew that going to the ministry, for, it's for my dad. You know, he said, look, they're all poor. They're all broke. You're going to starve to death. I gained 50 pounds my first year in the ministry. Before God, that's the truth. I gained 50 pounds. I'm not recommending that. <laughs> I was single, and uh, I, I was very poor, and, uh, but I would go soul winning in the evening. And I learned something. If you soul win, door knock, from 5 to 8, people are having supper. And, and in the South, this is, even if they don't mean it, this is what they'll say. Oh, we're having supper. Would you like to come in? Now, you're supposed to say no. I said, yes, I'd love to come in. Because that can of spam out there right there is warm in that, in that car. I'd love to come in. Listen, I'd go soul winning, and I'd have four courses before I left the neighborhood. I gained 50 pounds. Aunt Dot said to me when she came home to see me, she said, whoa, boy, you're getting fat. So... I took my first church, and I'm still poor. And uh, there's a young lady that was introduced to me, and her dad was a multi-millionaire, multi-millionaire. When, when, when we would go out, because my car was not reliable, uh, we would take her. She never drove the same car. Her dad owned four car dealerships, and she had a new car every time she came to pick me up. And I said, this is of the Lord. Thank you, God. This is your will for my life. They owned homes on the coast. They owned homes in the mountains. I didn't even have to pray. I said, God, I have found the money. I mean, the, the, the woman. <laughs> well, I don't have to tell you. Holy Spirit interrupted me one day, and we were going through a season at the church where we'd grown and it, it made some folks mad. I don't know if you know this or not, but Baptists can get mad when they can't park in visitors parking a seat where they be seated where they've been sitting since Noah got off the boat. And we were growing and, and uh, I had uh, some staff that got mad and left and, and we had to call a music man. And that would be Christy's dad. Somebody recommended Christy's dad and said, you need to call him, come lead the music. In the midst of that, the Holy Spirit started dealing with me and said, um, do you really trust me? Yes, Lord, I trust you. I do. When do you want me to ask her to marry me? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, I, I, I want that relationship. I want it. And I said to the Holy Spirit, I don't know if you know this or not, <laughs> but I'm broke. She's not. She has money we could use for the gospel. That's how we do it, isn't it? That's how we do it, isn't it? We, we rationalize. Oh, Lord, I don't want to quit dating him. I mean, if he keeps coming to church, he could get saved. You don't have to be an evangelistic dater. God's holy enough to bring them to Jesus without you compromising and being unequally yoked and giving your heart to somebody that does not belong to your heavenly father. Do you understand? Y'all all right. Happy 4th of July. We... we Christy's dad came to lead music. Chris didn't come. She was backslidden, living in. Um. <laughs> Christy's dad started leading. We broke out in the move of God. But we'd get right on the brink and it'd stop. Get right on the brink and it'd stop. And even her dad said to me at one Sunday night, he said, I, I don't understand. I, I don't know what's happening. We'll get right on the cusp of a, of a move of God and it'll just stop. That night, the Holy Spirit said to me, I want that relationship. I said to God, God, we're, we're pure before you. We've honored you in all of our, our, our dating you know, principles. We don't, we don't cross lines. God, I don't understand. And the Holy Spirit of God said to me, I need to know what you want more. Do you want her or do you want me? Now, what he knew in the back of my heart was that there were some insecurities because I'd been raised that if you didn't have enough money, you'd never have enough happiness, and that's a lie. Because i got a heavenly father that can give what the moth can't eat, rust can't corrupt, and the devil can't steal. Do you understand? There's things going on in our, in our lives as believers that you can't explain monetarily. So faith sat down in my heart. And I remember, I remember when I sat down and I honored her and I, I said to her, we can't date anymore. And, and she left and I'm a single pastor and it wasn't but just a week or two 
we broke out in a move of God that was a snot slinging, hanky waving, pew jumping, Holy Ghost move of God. And in the middle of it, the Holy Spirit said, that's all I wanted. And do you know the next Sunday, guess who showed up? Now, she didn't come to hear the great preaching of Jeff Laborg. She came because her daddy said, hey, there's a Laborg kid preaching a gospel out here. And she said, not Jeff Laborg because he's dead in jail or in hell. That's what she said. That's what she said. She came just to prove her daddy wrong. Look, 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 look at me. Look at me. Even when you don't understand, 30 years later, if you'll take the title deed and walk by faith, I promise you the plan he's got for you is better than anything you could imagine. I promise you in the sweet name of Jesus, if you will relinquish that one thing, it doesn't have to be a sin. It doesn't have to be a gross moment of rebellion. Just give him what he's asking for. And in the moment you relinquish it, the moment you give it to him, I promise you, pressed down, shaken, running over, it's going to be better than you could have ever thought, hoped, or imagined. Because what faith does is it goes where he leads and it doesn't need an explanation because you know his heart and you, you so know you can trust him that wherever he's taken you is better than where you were. That's all faith is. Students, this week, you're going to be confronted to put on the whole armor of God. He's going to have to remove some things in order to instill some things. He's going to have to say to you, there's some rebellion, there's some idolatry. There's some things that are creating a, a, a breach between me and you. You're going to have to give it to him. But I promise you this, listen to me. You're living in the most incredible, unbelievable days that the church has ever had. We're on the brink of utter desperation in this nation. Everything is being set up for one man to rise up out of the sea. That literally is the Gentile world. And with him, he's going to bring every answer. He's going to bring, he's got, he's got something for every problem that we face. But I'm telling you, he's a liar. And when they say peace and safety and peace and safety, be, be, beware, beware. Now listen to me. If you get ready now, and you'll let the faith of God that snatched you up out of hell and promised you for heaven develop inside of you the character. I'm telling you, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has entered into your heart all that God's got to show you. You are that generation. You are the ones. It's not the White House. It's not Congress. I'm telling you on the authority of this book, there is a wave of revival coming before we get snatched up and taken out of here. And your generation has an opportunity to be a part of that unlike any other generation.